Hey, what's up everybody? Today I'm talking about the sport of tennis and photographing it. Now, I'll be brutally honest, I don't photograph a lot of tennis, but I think I've done it enough that I can give you some tips and tricks based on my own personal experiences. As part of this, I'm gonna talk about some strategy, some positioning, uh, composition and timing, some of the types of shots you should be uh, looking for, there is some code of conduct that you need to you know, follow along with so you don't get yourself in trouble with officials and coaches. And then finally, I'll get to gear, which is everybody's favorite subject. All right, let's get going. When it comes to positioning, you're really bound by whatever the venue you happen to be at. If you're a professional tennis photographer and you're at the US Open, Wimbledon, those kind of things, it's a big open court and there's no fences. However, for the rest of us who are not in those kind of situations, we're shooting, say, college level on down, you're gonna have run into courts that are just surrounded by fences. And how you set up and where you set up is really bound by what those fences are like. Come on, let's talk about it, and I'll illustrate it for you. All right, well, we see here a tennis court, uh, which you might find in any college, high school, tennis facility, that kind of thing. And you'll also notice that it's surrounded by a fence. Now, dollars to donuts, that fence is a green color. And if you look at the right-hand side there, it's got a screen, which is also a nice green color. I've encountered these kind of things on a regular basis. My strategy is don't shoot through the fence. If at all humanly possible, don't shoot through the fence. I will talk to anybody and everybody, usually coaches and officials, to say, hey, can I get inside this fence line? Because shooting through the fence line, especially when it's green like this, is very difficult to edit out of your photos. I know people will tell you you can, and you can, but it is very difficult. So I avoid shooting through fences like the plague. Now, having said that, let's for a moment just forget there's that fence around there and talk about perfect conditions where you wanna set up at. Now, in most courts that I have been to, they are not completely surrounded by fences like this. Usually, there is a break between the two fence lines. It is completely open. You can shoot through it. There's usually some sort of partition between them, but it doesn't extend all the way. Usually, I'll put myself on a court that's not being used and photographing the court that is, just outside that little partition, that break between them. And I usually position myself farther back and I'm aiming at the tennis player who's actually facing me. So I'm trying to get head on, face on shots. And I will do that on either side whenever possible. In a break in the action, if I wanna get the other player, I'll just switch sides. An alternative location is somewhere in the middle where you, you Put yourself in a position where actually basically in this toward the center line and that way you can shoot in both directions so but in either position you get some pretty good shots head-on shots of and get nice facial expressions of the players as you're playing So when it comes to composition, timing, framing, lighting, these are some of the things to look out for. Lighting, well, most tennis matches are outdoors. So let's assume that you're gonna be outdoors. Lighting, of course, varies depending on the orientation of the court, time of day, what kind of cloud cover you have, or do you have cloud cover, those kind of things. Side lighting can be dramatic, as you can see in this photo right here, uh, creates nice contrast between light and dark in the, in the frame itself. Front lighting, of course, is more flat, and you could expose for more features, and hopefully it gets up underneath those hats that we're gonna have to deal with when we photograph uh, tennis. Back lighting can also not be bad. In this case, it uh, creates kind of a halo effect or a hair lighting effect. You will have to expose a little bit more because most of your subject's features are in shadow at that point in time. And then there's flat lighting when the uh, you have a lot of overhead cover. That's good, again, when we're talking about players who are wearing hats. You, uh, you get a little less shadow action there and you get a little more features in the shadow areas. Hats will always be a problem when you're photographing tennis. Obviously, uh, you just have to work around it and find good angles where their hats are not affecting it or just accept it and work with the shadows that you've got. Uh, continue on with composition, let's talk about framing. First of all, always avoid chopping off limbs. You know, it's not great when somebody's hands cut off outside the frame. 
as far as body, you know, how much of the body you include, you can do half body, three quarter body, full body, that doesn't really matter. As long as you're not chopping off limbs as much as possible. Always try to fill the frame. That means using longer lenses usually. That just gives you uh, less cropping, less degradation of the images. Uh, that's also part of the reason I tend to use full frame cameras is because you just have more latitude when it comes to cropping. When it comes to framing your subject, I like to use rule of thirds, but either way, you want your subject to look like it's going into the frame, so give them a little room to move into the frame, rather it looks like they're falling out of the frame. The last thing I'd say is you need to anticipate that the ball is coming into the frame. So say I'm focused on this subject over here, but I can hear the other person hitting the ball to, to my right here, for example or they're grunting, or you can hear the ball coming off their racket. Either way, you know it's coming, right? I hit my shutter at that point in time, you know, let the continuous high framing go. So as the ball's coming in, I have a much better chance of catching the ball in flight or as they're hitting the ball, or the ball returning after they've hit it. If you wait until you actually see the ball, it's probably too late and you're not gonna hit that shutter button quick enough. So anticipate the ball coming into the frame. Real quick, code of conduct before we get to the gear part. First of all, there's no movement during play. So if you're right next to them, like I was illustrating before, just stand fast until they're done playing, and then do your movement around, okay? Next item is no flash during play. Not really a factor for me. I'm not sure when I would use flash, but no flash during play. And finally, no noise during the serve. Uh, I photograph during a serve. That's never really been a problem, but no, no cheering. Not that you're gonna cheer anyway, but no noise during the actual serve itself. Now when it comes to lenses, it really depends on how close you can get to the action. If you are able to get courtside to a match, you can get away with say a 70 to 200 without a problem. And this is my 70 to 200 2.8. You can even, you know, play around with say some wide angle type shots. Uh, here's a 24 to 70, and you get full bodies and the, the, all the action at, as a wide angle shot. But you have to be courtside basically to get those. If you're a little farther back, like I illustrated, uh, shooting across to the other side, you really need something in the 300 range, maybe even 400. This is my 200 to 500. I used this in the last tennis tournament I did, and it worked. Great. I never really needed the 500 except for one time. Because of the situation with the courts, I couldn't get full access. So I actually was shooting across one tennis court to another tennis court to get the action on that side just because of this whole fence problem. So that's when that 500 came in to use. But other than that, a 300 is probably good enough for most tennis action. Now, when we start talking about camera bodies, you know, what I'm going to tell you right now is pretty much true of any major sport that you participate in. You need a camera that's capable of shooting continuous frames at a fairly rapid rate. If you really wanna catch that ball in action flying through the air, you could try to time it with single shots, but boy, I'm gonna tell you, it's pretty hard. So the better camera you can get that has good frame rate, good autofocus capability of tracking people, the better off you're gonna be. This happens to be my D5, but most you know, higher level, advanced amateur, prosumer type cameras will serve you very well. If you're using something, a little, you know, considered amateur, you're gonna struggle a little bit more catching action. That's just the way it is, especially if it gets dark at night and then you start running into ISO problems. But bright sunny day, you know, even say the Nikon N50, which is a tiny little camera, uh, crop frame camera, will probably do okay with catching action. You just need to play with a little bit more and set your expectations accordingly. In that case, probably, lenses are more important in, in that case than the camera body itself. All right, since you're here, you might as well hit that subscribe button and the like. I would really appreciate it. And stick around, check out this video right here. I think you're gonna like it. Until next time, I'll see you.